Welcome everyone to AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday, part of AURI Connects monthly online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. I'm Dan Scogan, the AURI Director of Government and Industry Relations and your host on Webinar Wednesdays. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. This program aims to actively engage all participants in the food and egg industry to improve competitiveness of producers, businesses, and entrepreneurs through ongoing purposeful connection of resources and partners along the value chain and increased knowledge of opportunities, technologies, and trends. Now remember that this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Remember that you will be muted during our presentations, but you can send us your written questions through the Q&A portal on your screen. AURI cultivates relationships with a wide array of stakeholders on a regular basis, and 2021 was no different, and we did it in many different ways. Today, we will be reviewing AURI's work in 2021, and then hear from three organizations that collaborated with AURI on that work. So let's start with the AURI 2021 Year in Review. Joining us is Shannon Schlecht. Shannon is the Executive Director at AURI and is responsible for the overall strategic and operational oversight of the organizational staff, programs, and the execution of its mission. Shannon recently served as Vice President of Policy for U.S. Wheat Associates in Arlington, Virginia. He is also Director for the Ag Innovation Campus in Crookston, an advisor to the University of Minnesota Food Science and Nutrition Department, represents AURI on the Embold Executive Council, where he co-leads the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Collaborative Projects, and is a mentor for the Techstar Farm to Fork Accelerator, and is a trustee for the North Dakota State University Foundation. Shannon Schleck, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Fantastic. Thank you for that, for that welcome, Dan. It's great to be with you today. It's always a, a fun time of year to reflect back on the accomplishments that we've seen over the past year. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to sharing the story of ARI as well as hearing from our collaborators and partners uh, on the next segment of this, uh, of this webinar today. Uh, first of all, I wanna say it was a great year for ARI. We accomplished a lot of different uh, projects and a lot of different initiatives. Uh, and I also wanna thank our, our key stakeholder, the Minnesota legislature uh, for their continued partnership to advance opportunities for the agricultural and food innovation ecosystem. Uh, just quickly here on this slide, you can see that uh, we cover four different office areas, uh, but we also have 33 um, full-time and part-time staff that, that cover the entire state. And a lot of them are based virtually uh, around the state to respond to client questions and uh, make connections and build networks that, that can advance some agricultural opportunities. We also have 11 directors that pre present a wide perspective of, of a diversity of expertise, uh, and skills that help guide our strategic efforts and our program efforts to create the most impact possible uh, for the agriculture and food ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. You can see from, from this slide, uh, this is a 10-year total of different client projects that we've conducted around the state of Minnesota, looking at it by county. You can see we've had uh, projects in almost every county across the state over that 10-year period. Uh, and we also cover a lot of initiatives and convening events that, that cover the entire state as well. Uh, and in addition to client projects, we are regularly consulting uh, and developing projects or having dialogue with, with businesses that are looking to explore that never turn into full-time projects uh, where our, our reach is much greater to advance those ecosystem opportunities. Next slide, please. And this is a, a great slide to just uh, give a quick at a glance in terms of what happened at ARI during the past year. Uh, you can see that we opened 101 projects uh, over this, this past uh, fiscal year. Uh, closed 75 and serviced or worked on over 200 projects throughout the, the ecosystem here. Um, those are covered across a wide range of uh, activities, uh, right, through different initiatives, different projects, different convening events, uh, and we cover four focus areas, but then a lot of our projects cover multiple areas, and you can see that represented here as well. Uh, and regardless of the number of projects, we line up pretty uh, equally across uh, our different focus areas in terms of hours expended uh, to advance these projects. So our food projects tend to be um, smaller, uh, but our bio-based renewable and co-products tend to be quite larger in terms of the, uh, the time that's required to meet the objectives. And you can see here that our ARI Connects program just exploded over the past year in terms of the number of new participants uh, and the number of total participants that we had uh, during this past year. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I'm just going to uh, touch on briefly uh, some of our focus areas and work that we do in them just for uh, um, an understanding of the work that ARA does on value-added agriculture. Uh, starting with our, our food focus area, we have a, a really vibrant and active ecosystem for food. Uh, we cover a lot of different, different areas from educational tools to initiatives to thought leaders that we pull together. Uh, and we provide technical assistance in terms of questions that entrepreneurs may have in, in terms of nutritional facts panels, uh, shelf life stability, product evaluation, and product development, uh, helping them with food safety and regulatory issues as well. Uh, it's really a, a, a wide range <laughs> that our food scientists and our business development directors uh, take on to help turn these ideas into realities and help get them onto the commercial, uh, the commercial shelves uh, and into re retail uh, opportunities. Uh, just a few of the, the logos here of companies that we helped out during the past year that you may recognize. Uh, next slide, please. Our co-products area is really an area that has grown, I would say, over the last, the last couple of years. We've expanded our footprint um, where a lot of this activity takes place in Wasika. Uh, and really companies that are looking at circular approaches, how do they contribute to their sustainability goals uh, by moving byproduct streams or waste streams into a value-added opportunity. A lot of this comes down to how do we dewater and dry uh, some of those products that are coming out of processing uh, and then densify and pellet them to make it more economical uh, to move them logistically uh, as well as to get the, the um, characterization or the nutrient density uh, that's needed for either feeds or fertilizers or, or possibly for, for biomass fuel. Uh, so a lot of great work that this team is doing in terms of uh, looking at those opportunity spaces, helping companies explore uh, ways that they can create another value stream. Uh, through their food processing or agricultural processing um, businesses that they have set up. Uh, next slide, please. In our renewable energy area, this is really looking at how can we replace um, petroleum products, uh, right, in terms of uh, using renewable feedstocks. Uh, so we do a lot of work continuing to support the bi biofuels industry, whether it be uh, biodiesel or uh, the ethanol industry with questions that they have, uh, opportunities that we can explore together that may be beneficial to their operations. Uh, this year, we also undertook uh, some key initiatives in different areas, uh, one of those being hydrogen and green ammonia. Uh, we were a, a key partner in getting a hydrogen economy collaborative started. Uh, that's a, a regional approach in terms of looking at um, how does hydrogen play into uh, the energy opportunity space. Uh, for ARI, we're mainly looking at that from an agricultural standpoint in terms of uh, what are opportunities in agriculture uh, as, we, as we look at a hydrogen economy. But we've also been doing a lot more work on renewable natural gas and um, anaerobic digestion opportunities uh, that could benefit um, farmers and uh, food processing through uh, collaborative or community type programs uh, where we can create renewable natural gas for, um, for, the, RN, for the RNG uh, side of it, as well as uh, looking at the digestate for fertilizer uses and, and other opportunities there. Uh, so a lot of this has been through industry discussions, just scoping and mapping out what are the, the opportunity areas uh, and then starting to put together a framework on tactical um, approaches that we can take as an organization. Uh, next slide, please. Under bio-based products, uh, again, this is a, an area that, that has a lot of opportunity. We've been working on a, a road cement project with Minnesota Soybean and Biospan Technologies for several years with the city of Hutchinson, uh, looking at what are the opportunities and the uh, benefits uh, of using road preservation products that are mainly um, soybean oil uh, based. Uh, and we just finished a, a life cycle cost assessment there, looking at, at the benefits. Uh, we've been doing feasibility analysis and insights around using hemp in different products uh, and technical insights for new packaging or new packing products uh, using starch, uh, for example, uh, and just ver various product development opportunities there. Uh, and we've uh, been highlighting several of these through our webinar Wednesday uh, uh, platform. Next slide. So uh, those are, are some of the key areas that we've looked at from a, a from a focus area standpoint. Uh, we also do a lot of public initiatives for educational opportunities and just creating more awareness uh, around, you know, what are some areas that would benefit the agricultural and food industry uh, through looking at these from a, a different approach and just um, creating more opportunity awareness of those areas. Uh, I just mentioned the, the road sealant feasibility work that we have done with the city of Hutchinson. Uh, I think great um, outcomes and analysis there in terms of how we can use uh, and agricultural products such as soybean oil to help extend the, the life of roads, uh, create some environmental benefits and help lower um, costs right to cities in terms of maintaining their, their roads. Uh, Minnesota Soda Aquaculture Report came out earlier this year, uh, looking at what are some of the challenges, the opportunities, uh, as well as just a better understanding of where the consumer is and, and looking at locally grown uh, seafood or food for food fish 
uh, right, in terms of um, uh, what are the ingredient opportunities there, or I should say feed opportunities for our local crops that we raise, uh, and then looking at another sustainable protein source for, for the consumer. Uh, we know that the uh, pandemic shifted a lot of things to the, uh, the digital platforms and, and e-commerce. Uh, so we did put out a, a digital and e-commerce guide in partnership through our Agricultural Innovation Partnership Program last year uh, that uh, provides uh, insight and just uh, variables that um, entrepreneurs should be aware of as they look at, uh, at their digital and e-commerce strategies. Uh, we work closely with the U of M, um, Backman Foods, uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, uh, and, uh, and uh, Minnesota Wheat on a FODMAP and ATI wheat project. Uh, so this was really looking at what are, why are we seeing more digestibility issues with wheat food products? Uh, and is there something besides gluten that we could explore that might be uh, causing those issues uh, from a digestibility standpoint? A really interesting study. Uh, we've done several webinars on this as well that are available on our, our website to take a, a closer look at uh, and um, looking at how we can advance that and look at some new opportunities for wheat producers uh, here across the, the state and region. A uh, co-manufacturing report that we did with the Region 9 Development Commission and MDA as well. Um, that is uh, looking at this perceived lack of, of uh, space available for scaling of, of food and beverage opportunities within our state and uh, trying to keep that local as they scale up, um, as well as for uh, companies that might want to scale down to test uh, different product lines as well. I think you'll hear more, from, more about that from uh, Allison later on in the next session. Uh, and then our stakeholder analysis where we look at gaps and collaborative opportunities across uh, all of our stakeholders, uh, agriculture and ecosystem partners in terms of what are areas that they're exploring and how can we uh, create some additional collaborations there. Uh, next page, please. Uh, and finally, we were uh, fortunate to receive some additional funding from the Minnesota State Legislature last year to advance some local and regional meat processing uh, areas. So uh, one is a mobile meat slaughter grant uh, and uh, the other is to uh, um, an agreement with USDA, a marketing service, uh, to really look at uh, how can we create uh, more opportunities, more resiliency for local and regional meat processing? Uh, that'll be an area that we continue to work on for the coming, um, coming years uh, as we uh, uh, look at supporting that, that area uh, of our agricultural industry further. And then finally, I just mentioned a few collaborations here, uh, such as the Egg Innovation Campus that I think Mike will touch on later on. Uh, really unique concept um, scheduled for, for Crooks in Minnesota, uh, the Crush Facility and Innovation Space. Uh, the Forever Green Partnership, where we work closely with the U of M on their program to um, look at commercialization opportunities for crops that are in their research pipeline. Uh, and then the MBO Coalition uh, of looking at how can we advance innovation and entrepreneurship opportunities that benefit uh, the state and region uh, through a, a collaborative approach with our legacy food companies, um, academic uh, institutions, uh, and nonprofit organizations that are part of that coalition. Uh, next page, please. And then I'll just touch on our ARI Connects program, which I, I mentioned earlier, really had a, a high growth in terms of uh, participation as we switched to, to virtual, uh, as well as some in-person events during the past year. Uh, we have uh, have uh, ongoing uh, programs under ARI Connects that include our thought leaders, where uh, we have different areas that we want to explore uh, and reach out to industry and other stakeholders to uh, talk about the opportunity, the constraints, and how we might move forward on, on putting that into action. Our Fields of Innovation program, which is really looking at um, niche and new crop opportunities uh, and creating awareness around those, those uh, opportunity areas. A webinar Wednesday, such as today, where it's uh, sharing more general information on what's going on uh, within the, the innovation space, uh, within the industry, uh, and with our stakeholders. Uh, and then we have two, I would say, key signature events that we conducted last year. One is our Renewable Energy Roundtable. Uh, so we're really looking at how we can advance renewable energy opportunities with, um, with the industry. Uh, and then the other being the Bold Open, uh, which we have done in collabor collaboration and partnership with MBOLD uh, to create an open innovation platform uh, to highlight key um, research areas that companies are looking for additional ideas around and how to create partnerships uh, between Minnesota companies and new ideas and new solutions and proposals uh, that can help solve some of those research challenges that they're facing. Um, next page. So we were also fortunate to be able to add some new resources this past year, such as the Food Grade Laboratory and Wasika uh, to help advance food ingredient developments, uh, including an oil seed press and a dehuller, uh, and then a, a portable anaerobic digester as well. I mentioned anaerobic digestion earlier. Uh, this new, new um, resource provides us a, a, great, a great way to look at feedstocks uh, and then um, um, looking at that from a scale-up standpoint as we look at these larger digesters beyond a bench top in terms of what is the economic opportunity as well as the, right, the products coming out of uh, a digester uh, that could provide value and, and help uh, de-risk that investment. Next page. 
And we were able to add three new positions uh, during this past year as well. Uh, one being a novel supply chains director looking at these niche and, and new crops. Uh, and then I mentioned the, the meat uh, work earlier. So we added a new meat scientist as well as a business development director to support local and regional meat processing. So great to have those new, re new resources on, on board uh, with us as we look at uh, moving forward in those opportunity areas. Uh, next slide, please. And then I'll just uh, close out here with uh, some of the impacts that we saw over the last five years. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I think, just uh, always exciting to share in terms of the impact uh, that we're having across the industry uh, and across the state in terms of uh, jobs created and retained. Uh, they're approaching, um, right, uh, it's, it's a, a high, high number, almost 600 jobs created and retained. Uh, the new capital investment around the state in terms of uh, businesses that we've helped de-risk uh, uh, these new opportunities for them to invest in of 118 million, uh, and then 321 million there in the estimated new growth sales that we contributed to uh, with clients uh, that we've helped throughout the, the past five years. So uh, I always love to see that, uh, that the work that we're doing and the de-risking that we're doing is leading to new business uh, and commercial opportunities. Uh, next page. And then I'll just close with uh, um, Minnesota and this region. It's just a, a, great, uh, a great environment for advancing innovation. There's a, some amazing ideas that we see on a daily basis uh, going on across the state. This is a map from uh, when ARI was founded from 1989 to, to current. Uh, you can see just a, a lot of dots and the, the reach uh, that we've been able to, um, to have uh, to explore innovation opportunities. And uh, a big thank you again to the Minnesota legislature for their partnership over those 30 plus years uh, to uh, advance opportunities for the egg and food industry. Uh, and I'm excited for this next segment as well in terms of uh, uh, the ecosystem advancements that we've seen over the last several years and just hearing perspectives from uh, uh, Allison and Jess and, and Mike in terms of what they're seeing, uh, what they're excited about as we look at um, 2021 as well as looking forward to the future years. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Dan. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. And uh, thank you for the uh, work that you lead at AURI. And as Shannon said, next we are going to hear some reflective thoughts on uh, 2021 and also some uh, forward-looking thoughts on what lies ahead from AURI collaborators. Uh, joining us today will be Allison Hahn, uh, Jessica Stalbum, and Mike Youngerberg. Allison is the Executive Director of Grow North, uh, leading strategy and growth for the organization. Prior to joining Grow North in 2020, Allison spent 10 plus years building a holistic understanding of the food product development cycle as a food scientist at Land Lakes and Target Corporation, where she mentored corporate accelerator companies on product development, uh, go-to market strategies, and scaled production. She holds a BS in chemistry from Butler University, a master's in food science from CFANS, and a master's in supply chain management from the Carlson School of Management. Jessica Stalbaum is a director of platform for the Techstar Farm to Fork Accelerator in partnership with Cargill and Ecolab and the Minnesota Twins Accelerator by Techstars. She's responsible for overseeing operations of programs along with continuing to support portfolio companies across both programs by creating opportunities to engage more deeply with the mentor and partner communities across the Techstars network. She holds an AS in culinary arts and an ABS in food service management with a concentration in beverage service management from Johnson and Wales University out of Providence, Rhode Island. And Mike Youngerberg is the Senior Director of Product Development and Commercialization at Minnesota Soybean. He provides staff management for the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Minnesota Soybean Growers Association's New Uses Action Team. He also consults for the Production Action Team. In addition, he serves as the executive director of the Minnesota Biodiesel Council, which represents the biodiesel producers and feedstock providers in the state of Minnesota. So with that, Allison, we'll come back to you and uh, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Awesome, well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dan, and it's great to be here with my uh, fellow panelists to talk about the reflections on the year past and also looking forward um, to 2022. And for those who are not super familiar with Grow North, it's a nonprofit focused on supporting food and ag startups and entrepreneurs as they go on that journey. And we do that through connectivity, education, providing resources, um, helping with capital access, and pretty much everything in between. I have the, the very lucky position of kind of being the personal Rolodex for people in the ecosystem. And when they come to me and say, hey, I need help with this, I'm able to say, okay, we can connect you with these people. Here are programs that may be worthwhile um, and help them on their way. 
And so kind of looking back on 2021, Grow North did a lot of the, I would say, normal things that we do when it comes to education. Um, we had Food Egg Ideas Week, which went hybrid this year, um, and many other things. But one of the, the new developments that we launched in January of last year and are carrying through and expanding um, in 2022 is actually membership at an individual level. Um, and this was really to provide additional support um, and access for not only entrepreneurs, but for anybody who is in the ecosystem um, and in the food world, I would say. Um, when I spent time at Lando Lakes, I wanted to have access to how can I help entrepreneurs? I have all this technical knowledge. Um, how can I you know, mentor, do those type of things? And so membership is really all about building that community, um, that connectivity, and then providing extra access for especially entrepreneur uh, members of that group where we have additional roundtables and things like that where they can get connected to experts in the field and basically get one-on-one -on -one consulting um, you know, on a, a monthly basis as we move through that. And so if there are folks on the call listening in who say, hey, I would love to connect with more entrepreneurs, I would love to mentor, or if you are in need of that kind of connectivity, um, my doors, all my virtual door is always open. So feel free to email me or um, check out membership. And that would be one great way to, to get involved. Um, from a couple other aspects that we focused on, um, you know, education is a really big piece of it. Entrepreneurs tend to get very, you know, overwhelmed and are unsure of, you know, you can Google everything, you can find everything out there. So we really try to provide a nice stable way for them to get access to information that will help them on their journey. Um, and we also um, are looking to help them connect with capital access when it comes to when are you ready to raise, what are the options you have. Um, and that is a continuing to evolve landscape um, as we move forward. And then I briefly mentioned Food Egg Ideas Week um, that was virtual completely in 2020, um, was hybrid in 2021. We were able to have a few in-person events, which was great. Um, and it's a little TBD for 2022. Obviously, the COVID situation continues to evolve. So, you know, stay tuned as that comes around. But we've really um, had a good time kind of breaking out content at Food Egg Ideas Week to fall into one of three buckets. Um, information on food systems, information around agriculture, and information around uh, CPG or consumer packaged good products. And so we've had events and sessions kind of tackling all those facets. And we are lucky to partner with AURI and Techstars um, on the events for both of those. So it's always good to, to be in good company for that. Um, and then as we, the last kind of big event that, or I shouldn't say event, but um, uh, program that we launched last year was actually in, in concert with AORI and under the Embold banner, which was the Bold Growth Program. And this was really, I would call a uh, post accelerator accelerator, if you will. It was taking companies that were in growth phase that were at least 5 million or more in revenue. Um, so, you know, they have established product, value prop is there, they have customers, they're on their way, but they're really looking for some extra help and that boost in advancing their business. And the beauty of this program is that we were able to partner with all the Embold Coalition companies, which are the legacy companies in Minnesota, the Cargills, the Targets, the General Mills, Schwann's, um, you know, all of those companies around town. And they provided advisors and support um, and connections to help them advance their business on specific kind of project work. And so we had five companies in that cohort this year. We are just coming to the end of it. Um, so we'll be, you know, surveying and seeing what we did well, what we could do better. Um, we're hopeful that this will get approved and continue in 2022, so stay tuned. But I would say if you are a part of a company that fits that um, kind of bucket, if you know companies, keep an eye out. We will be recruiting for that most likely in end of February, early March. Um, and it really is a great way because no, um, no equity is taken, but no money is given. So there's no money exchanged. Um, so, you know, depending on what a company is looking to get, however, I would say the connections and the um, help provided is quite invaluable. Um, and these companies are getting direct access to people in these major corporations, which um, I would say the, the trend we see is early on, you can get a lot of free help. People are happy to reach out and give you some free advice, but as your company grows and tends to become more of a threat um, to some of these larger companies, they're not as nice about opening the door. And so we were able to do that in a very focused way and provide that access when it was needed. So. Um, and uh, Shannon and myself have run that program this past year. It's been a wonderful time and we're really excited about the work that's come out of it. Um, so looking forward into 2022, um, Gronor specifically is focusing on a couple of pillars um, of work. Uh, one around education that will continue to evolve and focus really on providing some uh, standalone modules to help people figure out, is their product really on the right track when you talk about value proposition? And also when you talk about 
kind of channel strategy optimization. I think in Minnesota, we are lucky that we have a ton of co-ops um, and we have, you know, the Kowalskis and the London Byerleys, and then people think, I'm gonna get into Target. And that's not necessarily the right growth strategy. And so we wanna help um, brands who have the right to win actually get a good growth strategy to do so. So we'll be building out modules around that. Um, the second one that uh, Shannon alluded to earlier was actually mid-stage manufacturing. Um, there's a huge issue of that kind of stepping stone moment of manufacturing not existing. People continue to grow and then they come to a point where they go to a co-man and they say, you don't meet our minimum order quantities and they don't have the capital to self-manufacture um, or pay for very expensive runs to you know, get some POs filled. So uh, there are multiple ways we'll be targeting this and I'm excited to partner with AURI. Um, we have a meeting coming up at the end of the month talking about this and figuring out what ways to tackle it. So um, there's a lot of need in this space. And those are really, those two initiatives, um, along with the third round capital access are really about kind of whittling down the companies that do have a right to win and should be moving forward. And then really opening up that funnel for those who are in that position. So they get the right um, access to uh, resources at the right time. Um, so we're not kind of stifling growth of some of these companies in our, um, in our sphere. Um, and with capital access, there is twofold to that. One, it's educating entrepreneurs on, you don't have to get VC money. You can go a bunch of different routes. You can um, find that money in different ways. And then also bringing forth more of those kind of angel investors for early stage capital investment. Um, access to capital at the early stage is one of the most um, problematic issues. When I talk to entrepreneurs, it's always, I don't have any money and I don't have anywhere to make my product. Um, so we're really trying to figure out how can we lower some of these systemic barriers um, and advance that. And we have a lot of wonderful partners in the ecosystem who are looking to do that with us. So um, some big bodies of work to tackle in 2022, but i um, excited for those nonetheless. And then um, I wanted to circle back on the membership piece because we have some new partnerships um, that we'll be launching here in the next month or so. One is with Kinetic, which is a platform around connectivity. So if you are a member of Grow North, you automatically get to be a member of Kinetic. And it's all about they use um, an AI platform to make connections for people. So if you're wanting to be a mentor or if you're wanting to grow your network, um, they actually do the heavy lift for you. You just have to say when and where you want to meet. Um, and they will have you pick the top topics you're interested in, things you want to get help with. So it's a way for us to continue to expand that network and provide some of that connectivity because the, the social capital involved is so important for entrepreneurs and especially ones who maybe aren't as extroverted as others or are a little overwhelmed now with being in year three of the pandemic. And so having a platform to help with that, we're really excited about. Um, and another is a, a group called Access for Partners led by John Mendesh, which they actually do a lot of client-based work. And um, they're, you know, we, we send people to AORI when you need, you know, formulation help, if you need shelf life help and things like that. Um, this group will be another um, way for people to get, be a client um, and get help on very targeted specific things. So it's a way to provide deeper, more richer resources for entrepreneurs we come in contact with on that platform. Um, and then we have, you know, collaborative events coming up with AORI and AgriGrowth in the new year. We are excited about FAI um, March 9th, 9th. If you're going to Expo West, we'll have a min mingle. Um, and I'm going to we'll wait a little bit. I know there's some exciting news about an innovation corridor on the ag front that AORI and others will be a part of. Um, and I might let Shannon talk about that a little bit more, but it's a great way if you're in the ag tech um, and ag side of the equation. Um, this will be a great way to get a lot more exposure, help, and support throughout the Midwest, not just here, you know, in our state or in our region. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, covered a lot of what we've got going on. Um, and I'm going to stop talking and pass it back to Dan because we have two other people on the call who have lots to share. All right, Allison, thanks so much. Great information. We'll come back to you with some questions uh, as the panel wraps up today. So let's turn our attention and, uh, to Jess uh, Stahlbaum. And uh, Jess, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Hi, Dan. Thank you. And Allison, that was a great update. I'm looking forward to seeing how we can help you. You have my number. <laughs> So um, just a reminder for everyone on, on the call who we are, Techstars is the worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed. We do this in a variety of ways, most notably through running global accelerator programs. Um, and Techstars Harm to Fork is the only accelerator out of our total of 44 that focuses solely on innovation throughout the food and ag industry. Um, and we are based here in Minnesota. So 2021 uh, specifically marked our fourth accelerator in partnership with Cargill and Ecolab. We invested in 10 new startups, which brings us to a total of 40 investments over four years, 39 of which are still active, which is a pretty big deal for us. 
Um, we did return to an in-person, albeit somewhat hybrid model this year, where we welcomed uh, startups to Minnesota from around the world. Although these things are complicated during the ongoing pandemic, we found that we truly value the chance for startups to experience our food and ag ecosystem with value partners like Grow North and AURI, for example. Um, and we really, really miss the opportunity to do that after having to go fully virtual in 2020. So um, because this year we were able to do that and show the benefits of growing a food or ag tech business here, uh, we did have one of our participating startups, Carbon Origins, relocate their headquarters to Minnesota as a result. They're extremely active in the community um, with their robotics to help last mile delivery. Hopefully you've seen them around. Um, so typically as early stage investors, we tend to gauge our performance by how our startups are performing. Um, and 2021 marked a huge milestone for us. So our portfolio company, Tribe Finance, who went through our first class in uh, 2018, successfully raised a $17 million Series A round um, to continue their work facilitating loans to the agriculture industry. Um, really unique amount of tech. They do have traction, and I, I will link to this article because it's interesting um, from AgFunder about it. But um, a lot of traction in Latin America, um, and over the next couple of years, we should see more from them in the U.S. as well. Um, we did see in 2021 an overall bullish market for investment as industries needed to adopt um, and support external innovation in order to just survive or pivot. Um, and that includes, of course, the food and agriculture industry. And because of that, we did see some initial success from recent graduates of program. Um, so to highlight a couple of companies from the 2020 class, I'll highlight Milk Movement, which is our Canadian company um, who does have pre-pandemic plans to relocate to Minnesota. We'll see how that goes, um, but they do have close ties here. They did raise $3.2 million to continue to help the dairy industry modern its, modernize its supply chain um, and have had incredible growth and traction in, in their team, both in the Midwest and other parts of the U.S., which is great. Um, we also saw success from our locally grown company, Economics, who's based in Rochester, Minnesota. They won uh, the Food and Ag Division of the Minnesota Cup and were also awarded some Launch Minnesota grants uh, near the end of this year. Um, so one of our startups from the 2020 class that just graduated in October also announced a $3.7 million round right after program, which is probably one of our more notable <laughs> size rounds that close to graduation, but we will be continuing to watch uh, this year's companies progress um, throughout this year and beyond, as that's just how investment and startups work. Um, as a company, um, Techstars has a few different updates that will affect us as the accelerator, obviously. But um, one thing I'd like to highlight from that perspective is that we have, as an organization, doubled down on our commitment to ESG investing. So we announced in August that we officially signed on to the UN's Principles for Responsible Investment, um, which is an investor initiative to drive the importance of sustainable investment globally. Um, we are publicly committing to back companies that will have a long-term impact on our world and society. And this will allow us as the accelerator to support our portfolio companies with appropriate ESG tools and some perspectives at an early stage and hopefully help increase their odds of long-term success as we realize as investors, responsible investing is, is both high, high reward um, and low risk. So um, looking forward to this year, um, Quite simply, we're running our fifth program in partnership with Cargill and Ecolab. Um, and so we plan to increase the amount of startups we invest in every year. And this year, we'll start with 12. So we're hoping to welcome 12 startups to Minnesota. Um, and like everybody else, we'll see, we'll see how that plan goes um, as we're currently continuing our, our pandemic woes. But uh, the 13-week program does start July 11th. And our applications for the accelerator open um, next week on January 18th. We have planned um, a new series of webinars to support our engagement with founders and startups in our pipeline and throughout the ecosystem. So hopefully you'll hear more about that um, as we open our applications next week. But it is our goal this year to continue to increase the engagement of, of the overall food and ag community here in Minnesota. Um, since we have valued our existing ecosystem partnerships so much, um, and we'll continue those. And for anyone on the call who's looking to get involved in the accelerator in another way, um, 
whether it's as a mentor, as um, subject matter expert, or even to explore business development opportunities with our portfolio startups, um, I welcome an email, a LinkedIn request, any of those things. Um, certainly open to having a lot of conversations and seeing how we can get people in the community involved. Um, so I think we're we're facing another bullish market. Um, hopefully, hopefully this year, um, everything is trending in that direction. And I think it's going to mean big money for, for food and ag. And so we are continuing to look towards different parts of our thesis to make sure that we are investing in trends that, that will remain sustainable. Um, I will promise our thesis will be published if you're interested in learning more about what we are investing in um, as we open applications in, on the 18th. So um, I will not elaborate on that right now. Back to you, Dan. Oh, th okay, thanks, Jess. Jessica Stalbum, uh, very good. She'll be available for a Q&A at the end of our uh, presentations uh, this afternoon as well. So we're gonna to turn to our third guest, Mike Youngerberg, uh, Senior Director of Product Development and Commercialization at Minnesota Soybean. Uh, Mike, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Thank you, Dan, and uh, great presentations. A lot of interest in uh, innovation and investment uh, happening. Uh, the, uh, I wanna focus my comments today more in the area of uh, growth in the industry, in the soybean industry uh, around soybean oil. Uh, for, for decades, uh, you know, we have uh, seen struggles with oversupply, low prices, uh, but now we're definitely starting to see supply changes develop as uh, innovation and expansions continue to happen in the renewable space almost daily now. Uh, on the renewable fuel side of the equation, biodiesel and renewable diesel are being looked to more and more as low carbon options for segments of our transportation industry. Uh, that are going to be difficult or a real challenge to uh, to move to an electric uh, basis. Uh, the growth happening here in you know the industry in 2021, uh, the biomass-based diesel production here in the U.S. rose to over three billion gallons, and uh, now the National Biodiesel Board is predicting that. Uh, the industry can grow, will grow to somewhere around that 6 billion gallon market by 2030. Um, you know, that being, you know, soybean oil, but other multiple feedstocks going into uh, that production. Um, this is really being driven uh, demand wise by state, federal, and even international standards now that are uh, pushing for more renewables, lower uh, carbon fuels. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of innovation happening all over the place. Uh, we've seen these uh, low carbon fuel standard programs uh, on the West Coast, uh, mainly led by California, but now other states, Oregon, Washington, uh, Colorado, uh, in, uh, Idaho, others uh, moving toward uh, reducing carbon uh, from their uh, transportation sectors. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of movement now in uh, the heating oil market and what they call what we call bioheat uh, up in the Northeast uh, US. Uh, the heating oil market is about a 4 billion gallon market. Uh, and it also is one of those areas which is um, hard to change. Uh, you know, putting uh, in new natural gas lines or other forms of uh, heat for home heating is a real challenge in you know, neighborhoods that have been there for a long, long time. So bioheat uh, is the answer for a lot of uh, reduction in uh, greenhouse gas and carbon uh, in that heating space. In fact, uh, the state of New York just passed a law enacting a, a, a statewide mandate for requiring uh, a 20% biodiesel blend in all home heating oil by 2030. Now, in talking to a lot of folks within the industry, uh, you know that that's a goal for 2030. But it really, uh, the heating oil industry is looking at uh, a goal of being 100% biodiesel in the heating oil. Um, changes are also happening in other parts of our transportation sector. Uh, the railroads in the U.S., who over the past number of years have wanted 
less than 5% biodiesel in their locomotives. They're now trying to figure out and explore uh, blends over B20 to address carbon requirements, lower carbon requirements by the, uh, the shippers on their lines and uh, uh, delivery people. Um, we just uh, recently uh, Maersk tankers, which uh, everybody you know sees the ocean going uh, companies out there, uh, just completed a marine biofuel uh, test of B30 in two of their vessels. So um, that industry is is really looking at how they decarbonize. Um, you know, sails used to work uh, on ships, but uh, uh, you have to have power to get those vessels, you know, from here to there. And two years ago, the word sustainable aviation fuel wasn't even being talked about. Yet today, the that market is is starting to grow, and we've got uh, airlines and companies um, moving, you know, to start increasing uh, content of renewables into aviation fuel. I think the biggest innovations that are really starting to happen are in how we produce the lower carbon fuels uh, across the board. Um, one of the things uh, that we're doing to help improve the uh, low carbon uh, biodiesel marketplace is uh, we've invested in biodiesel production technology that was developed by the University of Minnesota, which uh, will can have uh, significant carbon uh, reductions for uh, existing biodiesel plants, uh, ethanol plants, uh, uh, anyone who is producing biodiesel, uh, it will help uh, lower that uh, carbon score. And we're also able to save these plants uh, somewhere in the neighborhood to of eight to 10 cents a gallon on their production costs, just because of uh, the savings within the process uh, that uh, it is, inevitable. Uh, the technology is called Plasma Blue. Uh, in fact, uh, I am going, we're going to be out in the National Biodiesel Conference here starting next week uh, to show that off to the industry. And uh, we already have uh, some customers uh, uh, moving forward on that. So really exciting to uh, see, you know, new technologies and innovations and an old, um, kind of an old technology that still is uh, relevant today for our uh, future. Uh, but beyond biodiesel, you know, which is also soy methyl ethers, uh, is being used in a, a whole lot of other, you know, products or base products for new technologies, uh, things such as uh, road preservatives. And uh, Shannon already, you know, mentioned the uh, replay asphalt preservative product and the a collaborative effort that we did with the city of Hutchinson um, and uh, through SRF consultants, uh, that analysis of those streets that were uh, applied uh, with the replay product. Um, it was three and a half to 11 years uh, that we've extended the serviceable life of those streets uh, with those replay applications. So um, it's very exciting that you know, we can we can not only create new products, but we can save some of the um, costs and infrastructure that we already have. So, and I think the biggest inno innovation that uh, we're uh, looking at now is, in Minnesota soybean is what Shannon mentioned about the construction of our Ag Innovation Campus in Crookston. Um, uh, Partners in the Ag Innovation Campus or the our, our Soybean Checkoff Program, AURI, and our Minnesota Soybean Growers Association. Um, it's going to be a location that will foster and help those next advances in innovation for agriculture. Um, and not only will we house the mechanical crush operation, but we will also offer those base uh, processed ag products to uh, companies and researchers who want to come in and. Uh, work on new ideas, base spaces for uh, them to uh, bring in equipment or new technologies. And uh, also, uh, since we are a 501c3 uh, not-for-profit uh, dollars from the 
uh, crushing operation and other things will be put back into the Ag Innovation Campus to continue to uh, enhance its uh, capabilities as a uh, place for research, a place for education, um, you know, just all kinds of things uh, that uh, push the future of agriculture forward. Um, and it'll also be the home, as Shannon mentioned, for AURI, so um, they can help uh, even expand their client base, which uh, helps everybody. Uh, if you get the base product, then you get to move to someplace like the Ag Innovation Campus, where you can even test that out at a higher level. That's the area of, um, of most opportunity as we see it. Uh, uh, phase one of the Ag, Ag Innovation Campus uh, will be operational this fall, and the other phases will come as uh, we secure funding and move forward. So, so um, look for a lot more innovation to come from Minnesota soybeans. So, and thanks, Dan, and thanks, AURI. Well, thank you, Mike, uh, for uh, participating with us today, Mike Youngerberg. And uh, he's going to stick around, too, if you have specific questions. I think we'll uh, go to our panelists now and, and uh, get a few questions answered. And uh, Allison, I think I'll start with you. Uh, you talked a, a little bit about the, the education pillar that uh, you're working on. And I'd just like you to expound on that a little more. Uh, some of our uh, people on, on the uh, webinar today may be wondering uh, a little more detail on, on what that pillar looks like and what you hope to accomplish with it. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. And as a point of reference, so in 2021, you know, we had monthly education um, that was kind of focused on a 101 level or a 101 plus. And all of those um, education sessions and webinars um, are all available on our website. So if you, you know, were interested and didn't want to go, um, didn't, weren't able to attend day of, we do have them. They live on in infamy. So you're able to access them. And they really kind of follow the journey of an entrepreneur. So from you know, figuring out finances um, and doing that all the way through, you know, market strategy into um, the really big one was Coman. So not only knowing when you should start looking for a Coman, um, but preparing to do that search and then what you need to do to prepare for it. Um, and we ended actually in December with a session around, um, you know, as you're preparing to raise capital and what that should look like um, and the things investors are looking for. And we also partnered with Deed on a session around the angel tax credit incentive. So, um, for companies who have, you know, they're starting to do a fundraise um, and they want to get angel investors, Deed has, you know, buckets of money that are used to have kickbacks for angel investors. So it's a great way to kind of uh, put a little extra pressure on an angel investor when you can say, hey, you can actually get reimbursed for a certain percent of your investment. So it's a nice little added tool and it can be a little daunting because as we all know, sometimes the government isn't the easiest entity to work with. And so we wanted to provide a little bit of handholding um, with that. So we are excited to offer that. But in 2022, um, we'll really be focusing on um, two things. One, things are going to be more of like the 201, 301, 401 level of content. Um, so, you know, you can Google things anywhere. We want to make sure we're providing education that is a little more in depth. And what will go hand in hand with that is a lot more kind of the um, founders forums or connecting with the experts or the subject matter experts that can actually answer questions in the moment. We found often that with education, the Q&A section um, was the most active because people want to have that chance to ask, hey, my product is this, I need help with this, what do you recommend? And so offering, you know, the Founders Forums in 2021 were 90 minutes of that where we would just take six people at a time. And it was great because not only do they get their questions answered, they often learn from their other founders. So it was a great kind of networking moment for people to say, oh, you do that, I use this. And so we'll be focusing on a couple of key things, especially around um, scaling. So if you think about what distributor should I get, um, where can I search for commands, um, things kind of in that nature, um, which people need a little bit more of a, a helping hand and can often seem like a black box where they don't even know where to start. Um, and I'm going to throw out the stat around, you know, that's a, a jump off point for co-manufacturing and the work there. Um, and the, the stat I love that AURI and MDA have from the report is that an investment a 5% in manufacturing in the food and ag space would yield an $11 billion increase to our GDP and the creation of 160 some thousand jobs. So this uh, mid-stage manufacturing and additional processing is a huge opportunity space. Um, we have a number of partners we're looking for for that. And it's not just about in the metro, it's really about outstate Minnesota and some of the cities and towns around 
the state where, hey, if you can get people to stay in state, it's a couple hours drive, but now you're creating economic development and job creation in those cities. Um, it's really a win-win for everyone. So we're really excited about some of the opportunities in that space, but sorry, that was the sidecar on for, for the co-man piece. But yes, education will be in depth um, and lots of opportunities. Thanks, Allison. Uh, I'm gonna throw the wild card question out there. If you have a question, I prefer that you use the Q&A portal. That, that's a little easier for us to uh, use, but I see in our chat, we have uh, a question. Can I apply for an immigration visa to Minnesota from Texas? Does anybody have uh, the legal knowledge to answer that question? I'm hearing no one running to the batting cage, so we'll move on. I don't know the answer to that one either. Jessica, you talked about some award winners within your program. And I think that is uh, something of interest because sometimes that comes with monetary or, uh, or, or relationship awards. And uh, talk a little bit about that process for the entrepreneur or the startups. Uh, how much help are they given? Uh, do you help them identify uh, and enter into those uh, innovative competitions or, or how does that process work? So like anything they do, they're pretty much on their own. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Poor entrepreneurs. Um, no, so a lot of where we focus um, is through our relationships, right? So through partnerships with our accelerator, especially because we take advantage of being based here in Minnesota, um, we like to focus on the um, opportunities that might be available here as a highlight of, of coming or being exposed to this ecosystem. Um, and it's sort of where we're experts, right? So for economics, they already knew about the um, Minnesota Cup. It's pretty famous here in Minnesota. If you're if you're not aware, it's run by the Carlson School, the University of Minnesota, um, and highlights entrepreneurs doing great things in our region. But um, yeah, it's it's really um, like to Allison's point, we are highly focused on VC and investment as a company, as, as TechStars. It's because we are. Um, venture capital investors, but we do understand that there is an array of different types of capital that is available to startups and they don't always have the information they need to access that. So we do work with Grow North and other partners to help facilitate an understanding of what might be available to them and how to start the process, right? So this year we had a company um, from Africa doing great things in upcycling agricultural waste to come up with um, bioplastic replacements. Um, now, they have a decentralized manufacturing system that is highly capital intensive, um, and so VC funding is probably not their best way to get capital, for example. So we were highly focused on getting them the help they needed specifically surrounding grants and what may be available to them um, based on their region and geography as well. I just want to add on to that a little shout out, um, Lunar Startups, which is a local accelerator um, that focuses a lot on CPG products. So if you're in that camp, they actually have a module around capital and really educating entrepreneurs on, you know, is it friends and family? Is it banks, loans? Is it VC? And so um, I often send people to that as a great resource. Um, they're another great partner in our ecosystem. And so they have an existing one. So if you're curious about what that looks like and what your options are, um, they're a great place to start. And they also are opening their next cohort, um, I think, in this month. So applications for them are coming up, too. Good information. Mike, I'm not going to let you uh, leave without uh, posing uh, something uh, your way. And, and when, I, when I think about the panelists today, uh, you really need uh, Jessica and Allison to be successful to continue to drive uh, the innovation uh, with Minnesota soybean, I think, or U.S. soybean. But it's uh, so much, so many different things are coming at the producer these days. It's hard not to just say no to things that come along because we're comfortable the way we do things. How does U.S. soy or Minnesota soy uh, take on that challenge of uh, figuring out or identifying what we need to say yes to and what we need to help move forward in this ever-changing landscape? Boy, uh, if I had an answer to that question, I'd, I'd be sitting in somebody's CEO spot. Um, um, it is it is always a challenge to figure out, as you said, which way uh, you know things are uh, going in agriculture. Um, you know, I think producers want want to keep it more simple, but I think simple is going by the wayside quicker and quicker all the time. Yeah, adoption of technologies, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, 
I think that um, you know we see companies out there, you know, in um, engaging farmers in carbon market discussions. Uh, I think there's a whole lot of opportunity, but a whole lot of skepticism. So uh, you know, we're we're to that point where uh, it's almost at you know, it's show me, and if my neighbor is um, is feeling good about it, uh, or you know, whether it's a technology or a process, uh, more likely to be adopted. But it it is definitely definitely a whirlwind of things coming. And Shannon, uh, I think all three of our presenters today use the term relationship at one time or another. And these are three groups that we have a good relationship with, but uh, AUI really functions on the relationships that uh, the organization has built over the last 30 years. Yeah, well said. Collaboration is uh, the name of the game, um, right? In terms of, uh, of trying to move these, these areas forward. And I think we're seeing that more and more uh, right through uh, through greater collaborations and just the, uh, the number of requests we get to collaborate and, I think the innovation corridor that also mentioned of just of greater collaborations um, right across the region, uh, as well as just going to continue to increase. And we see that through our stakeholder analysis as well. Last question, and then Shannon's going to do a quick wrap for us today. So we'll go alphabetically. We'll go Allison, Jess, and then Mike. What's the next big thing? Allison, what are you, what are you hoping to see happen in the very near future? Oh, that's a tough one. Um... Oh, this is where Sorry. Danny, you're supposed to warn us on these softballs. It's not a softball. The next you can pass. <laughs> pass and come back to me. I want to think about. Okay, so I'm thinking Jess. of ag versus CPG. Cool. Thanks, yeah. Allison. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it's an exciting year for for ag and food tech, quite frankly, and I, I think we're going to see some of the growth in the ag tech industry in particular start to see some maturity. We're going to see larger deals. Um, maybe some M&A specifically for, for those like precision ag and companies that have been around a little bit longer um, than, than the new alternatives, so to speak. But I, I think it's also going to be a new year for, for alternative everything, right? As sustainability becomes more and more important to, to survive. And I'll just, I'll stop on that note. Mike, do you see uh, the next big thing yet? Um... Well, there's always, you know, always that next big thing around the corner. Um, I think the opportunities in, you know, bio-based products, renewables is going to continue. I don't see, um, you know, society, you know, uh, trying to figure out how we address, you know, the climate conversation. Um, it's just inevitable that I think agriculture is going to play a role. It's just how is that, what's that role going to look like? Um, you know, it's just, you know, can we sequester carbon and also deliver uh, more product, better product, um, you know, to whatever customer it is? Allison, anything to add? Yeah, I'll say kind of um, springboarding off of that, for, on the regenerative ag side, there's a big focus now on the quality of food that's coming out, so the nutritional content. And I think there's going to be more of a focus on that in the future um, as people look to processes and all of those are kind of rolled into one. Um, on the CPG front, I'm actually curious on the plant protein landscape because that has been, you know, continuing to explode. However, um, they had a little bit of a health halo to begin with, and now people are realizing some of those products are just as processed um, as other center of store products. And so um, as those, you know, companies and products start to clean up their act, it'll be interesting to see what the really, um, the delineation is of people who are vegetarian or vegans looking for those products and also for kind of the, um, you know, the classic meat eaters who are interested in trading in for that Meatless Monday or are curious about trying it. So um, the evolution of the plant-based industry, I'm very curious to, to see where that's going to go. Absolutely. Well, I, sure. I, want, I want to thank Allison, uh, Jessica, and Mike uh, for your time today, and uh, we appreciate it. As we get ready to wrap up uh, this webinar Wednesday, I do want to invite Shannon back uh, to the program for just a few comments on what AURI sees for 2022 and beyond. Yeah, perfect, Dan. I know, and, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your for your input today and for the the conversation. Uh, I think I touched on a lot of the initiatives that ARI is looking at for the for the coming coming year. Um, right, there's just a lot of opportunity space for agriculture, as was mentioned, in terms of uh, carbon markets and sustainability. Uh, we look at sustainable proteins uh, and the work with uh, Grand Recipe and the proposal that they were selected to to move forward. 
uh, as part of the uh, Build Back Better Economic Development Agency efforts. I think there's going to be um, some great opportunities around sustainable protein. Uh, and then I look at the, the local and regional meat processing and just food supply chain resiliency as well, as we look at the co-manufacturing report and some other areas that we can try to move forward. Um, I'll just touch on um, some events coming up that I, I think will be great for participation. One um, is our new uses forum coming up in March. Uh, we're, we're partnering with Computer Financial and Georgetown's Rural Opportunity Initiative to highlight capital as well as innovation opportunities for food and ag. Uh, as um, <clears throat> Jess mentioned, the Techstars application coming up uh, and just the membership and the educational programs with Grow North. There's just uh, great ways to get involved. I'd say intersections and on-ramps, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, entrepreneurs and innovators in our ecosystem. Uh, so our, our ecosystem is rich. Uh, there's opportunity and uh, we look forward to collaborating uh, with all of our past partners and uh, with future partners here going forward into 2022, Dan. Thank you. And that concludes AURI Connect's Webinar Wednesday for today. We do want to thank our presenters and our panelists today. AURI Connect's Webinar Wednesday is presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. We're interested in your feedback, so please respond when we send you our evaluation. And remember, for more information on today's program or any of the work that AURI is involved in, you can go to auri.org. Now, please join us for the next AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday coming up February 9th at noon to learn about cultivated wild rice. You'll hear from experts in the field about its health benefits and the impact on the egg industry, as well as the latest research. And you can always learn more about other work that AURI is working on by going online to auri.org. We're looking forward to having you join us again in February for another AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday.